Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another lesson. We've just concluded chapter 20. At the conclusion of chapter 20, we discussed mm -hmm. the power of speech and the process. And I, a person would have a desire and form the desire that goes to the heart, imagining how it feels, why he wants it. Then it would come up to the mind to start contemplating how to reach that target. That's when words will come into the mind and then it will bring him into acting. Going on Amazon or going to Home Depot mm -hmm. to buy the lamp, the device that he likes, Best Buy, etc. Now he's going to talk to the salesman uh, to learn and make sure that he gets the right product. Today, and therefore, one word, as we made the math, it's already the third time, I don't want to get to the details, one word is literally valueless compared to words a person speaks in their lifetime and definitely compares to words that we are thinking about in our lifetime. For God, who is endless and he does is not finite, one word or 127 words that God used to create the universe have no value. And therefore, it doesn't matter to God if we do something or not. The two commandments that God gave us from the first two, I am your God and don't worship idols, is not referring no other gods, other idols that other nations worship. But as soon as we disobey God, we are creating a new entity that stands up to God and that's an idol. This is the essence of chapter 20. In chapter 21, the rabbi wants to go farther to the, speak the idea of speech. I want to give you an introduction mm -hmm. and then uh, hopefully you'll be able to go a little fast. By the way, as a reminder, and I'll remind you at the end, hopefully, there will be no class this next week and the following week as well. We'll re um, reconvene again in three weeks. Everything God created in this universe, every trait, every benefit, every talent has two sides. There is a benefit and uh, there is a deficiency. There is no such thing as perfect good. People with too much money, their life get destroyed. I showed you took numerous times mm -hmm. The people who won the lottery, 94% of them had destroyed their life. Either they got addicted, they got divorced, they got murdered. Children murdered them to get their money. They invested so badly that they are in debt and became homeless. They mostly are wish that they did not won the lottery. Even though we, it's not one of us, for sure. <laughs> if we're going to win, we're going to know how to handle that. I know locally... Right. Oh. <laughs> we go in together. All right. As they say, take a number. <laughs> I asked from somebody help today who is capable of helping, and he says, You know what? If I win the lottery, I'll help you. <laughs> so I said, Do you buy lottery? He says, You know, for you, I'm going to go out and buy a lottery. <laughs> I wanted to say, give me the dollar that you spend. It's more. It's two dollars. More, two dollars, right. Back to our discussion here. Anything that exists in this universe creates also limitations, any positive. For example, a big person is also unable to fit into a small window, to a small area. A small person cannot reach in the kitchen up high. A smart man, wise man, uh, is unable to be walking simply and take people's word because he needs to contemplate and dig deeper. What do they mean? Did they mean this way? Did they say that way? Are they really mean it? There is nothing in our universe that has only benefits, nothing. Everything has great benefits, but it comes with a price. It's like two sides to the coin. So when I say someone is a great speaker, 
that's very, very good. But most likely it will get them in trouble because that's the uniqueness of speech. Speech, I'm gonna talk about the positive and the, neg and the negativity or the, the misfortune of speech is that you have no control after you have spoken. As soon as you utter the word as like shooting an arrow, you have no control, you can't take it back. How many times, and we spoke about it a few times over the last two weeks, how many times people say, I wish, you know, I never spoke. There is a famous story of a rabbi who begged for help. And the, in, at night he went home and he regretted it. He, he felt that he should have trusted God. And he prayed to God for a great miracle that the people should forget about his plea. And a miracle happened that people forgot about his talk, the, what he was talking about the night before. In other words, the speech, once it's spoken, it has ramifications. Sometimes I, I, I looked at a video that I pre presented. This happened three years ago. Uh, my daughter got married and I did two, 10 things to know that you go to the right wedding. You know, that, like Dave Letterman had the, the paper. You saw. I did that, 10 things, number 10, 9, 8, 7. Now came the wedding of the other son of Mandy. So somebody said to me, do the 10 things, do 10, 10 uniqueness. So I went back to look at those 10 things. It's on YouTube, but if you don't know the the exact address, you won't be able to find You can search it, it wouldn't come up. So I I am ashamed. There are things that at the time I was so proud and everybody in the family was cheering me up for pointing out the exact characteristic of the person. And there are things there that I really define that person in a very unique way. Today I'm embarrassed. I'm sure she's embarrassed too. Because as time go by, you go back to words you said and you wish you didn't say. That's the negativity of speech as opposed to thought process. I can think anything I want about you. I can smile and wish I didn't see you. I can wish I wasn't here and smile. You will never be able to tell what I'm thinking about. Thinking thought does not have that problem. You can always take it back and you can bring it out. You have full control. Not so with speech. Thinking is not prohibitive, right? Or... Thinking is very prohibitive. Okay. Uh, in the Torah, in the, uh, in the Holy Temple, sacrifices had to be brought with the proper thought process. Mm -hmm. So if someone needs to bring a sin offering and he's thinking he's bringing a gift, then it's uh, disqualified and it's a sin. In addition to that, um, there are times that when it comes to um, the Holy Temple, if someone s thought that he's gonna do something, contribute or be generous, they have to keep it just like a word that we make a, a pledge. But there was something else about uh, um, thinking. Um, I forgot. Back to our discussion. If I am to just other words, I will not have control after they came out. That's something that defines speech as opposed to uh, thinking. If I want to speak about God spoke, it's impossible. And I'll tell you why. First, because God is everywhere. So there is nowhere the words can go outside of God. Number two, if you say that after God spoke, he has no control over the world, over the words, then the words went out, created universes as God spoke. And now it's not under his control. Because if my speech, once it leaves me, it is, I'm not, not in control any, anymore. You heard it and it will not change your mind. I cannot convince you I didn't say it and I cannot take it back. If it's God, if with God's speech is the same, it means that he can create the universes with the words and the words can operate on themselves. So he has no control over the universes and that cannot happen. Therefore, as we'll discover, speech when it comes from God's point, 
comes without the negativity. But before I want to show it to you a story. There is a fame, it's a story about Reb Chaim Brisker. Reb Chaim of Brisk later became a giant of Torah, not Hasidic, but a giant of Torah, lived at the same time of the Alter Rebbe. He was a very bright prodigy. He was an extremely, extremely bright child. When he turned Bar Mitzvah, there was a, his father was the rabbi of Brisk. So the Bar Mitzvah was hosted by many, many people. Many guests came, aside from family, community members outside the community, people who knew the father, the mother. And the child, he was 13, turned to his father and says, Dad, why are all these guests here? Because of me. So his father turned to him and he says, and why aren't there more guests than the guests that are here? That's also because of you. You got it, Ali? In other words, yeah, this child has brought many guests to the Bar Mitzvah, but this child is also the reason that other people the rabbi knew didn't show up because they had no relationship. So there is no such thing as pure positive. There is no 100%. That's the way God created the universe. It's a finite universe. If we talk about God, all the negativity, all the limitations don't exist. So when we say God spoke, God has full control over his speech. Just like my thought is in control, God's speech is in control. Then you can ask if so, why we say God said, let there be light. God said, let there be earth. God said, let there be animals. Let God think about it. Why does he need to speak? After all, if he has full control, it's more of the category of thinking rather than speaking. And I was going to explain that the, the purpose of speech is to express your desires outside of you. And therefore, thinking is not enough. There is a uh, famous story of two Hasidim who stood by outside the Rebbe's room and they were conversing. And the Gabbai, the sexton, went over to them and said, can you just leave the room and go elsewhere? And one of the Hasidim says, why? We speak in a hushed voice. The rabbi cannot hear us. And besides, if the rabbi can hear the voice of our speaking, he can hear our thinking, our thought process as well. So if the speech is disturbing him, our thinking also passes disturbs him. And the gabbai, the sexton said to them, there is a big difference. When you speak, the rabbi can hear you because once it comes out, it can be in a very harsh voice. He can hear you because he's a holy man. While you're thinking, whatever you think is something that is still internal. Therefore, it didn't leave your body, didn't leave your brains, and therefore it's part of you. So nobody else has right to it. So nobody knows, nobody is affected by it. In other words, there's a difference between thinking and speaking. And the big difference is not only we can control or lose control, but one is for me and the other is for somebody else. There, was, there were many rabbis that as soon as an idea came to their, to them in mind, their mind, they would speak about it. A famous rabbi, the Mezri Magid, the teacher of the Alter Rebbe, whenever an idea, a Torah teaching would come up in his mind, he would speak it loud. In the middle of a conversation, uh, somewhere, anywhere, riding a horse, he would think and an idea came, you'd speak it up. And the reason is he needed to express it outside his body so he shouldn't forget about it. Because once it's in your mind, it's easy to forget. It's internal. It's internal. Once it came out to the universe, there is a good chance you will come home and remember what you said, what you're thinking about. <laughs> so the rabbi is saying to us that as humans, our speech has negativity as, as plus and minus. God's speech is only plus, meaning he has full control. Why is it called speech and not thought? Because speech is about communicating outside, creating something else. And God wanted to create the universe, therefore he had to speak. God does not have a mouth, but the expression of godliness in a way that affects outside is considered speech. All that will lead us to the idea, this is all, so to say, an introduction to chapter 22, 
what's wrong with sin? After all, it is God's desire. If it's not God's desire, I cannot sin. That's going to be chapter 22. Let's go over chapter 21. We are starting on page 288. Now, the nature of the divine order is not like that of a human being, a creature of flesh and blood. Therefore, human terms cannot adequately describe divine qualities. Thus, in our case, when a man says something, the breath of the spoken word may be sensed and is perceived as an independent entity separated from its source, namely the 10 intellectual and emotional faculties, faculties of the soul itself. So when I speak, it left my body and you understand how I feel and what I want and if I'm happy with you and I like you, etc. What happens if people have these different emotions, they feel something towards somebody but they don't know how to express themselves, then the people outside of them even close member of the family or of spouses have no idea. You didn't say, you didn't tell me. While still encapsulated in its source, the word is utterly nullified. However, when it is spoken and it leaves its source, it takes on an identity of its own. This is true, however, only with regards to human speech. But the speech of God is not, heaven forbid, separated from his uh, divine self, for nothing is outside of him, and no place is devoid of him, so that his speech is always contained within him. So in that way, speech for God and speech for us is totally different. For me, as soon as the speech came, came I was uttered, it came out and left my body. By God, as soon as the speech was uttered, it's still part of God. Therefore, his speech is not like our speech, God forbid, just as obviously his thought is not like our thought, as it is written, for my thoughts are not like your thoughts. And it is also written, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Similarly, God's speech is different from human speech. But if divine speech is indeed never separated from God, how can it be described as speech at all? Human speech constitutes communicating communication only because the spoken word becomes separated from the speaker. Thought, by contrast, because it remains within its one soul, is hidden from all but the thinker himself. But since nothing ever becomes separated from God, the term speech seemingly provides us with no understanding at all of the entire, of the nature of the divine communication. In other words, the rabbis is saying that it should be considered thought, not speech, if it never leaves God. In explanation, the Alter Rebbe states that the speech, that speech is distinguished by two characteristics. A, it reveals that which was previously hidden in the speaker's thought, and B, it becomes separated from its source. Only the former characteristic of human speech is analogous to the divine speech, which reveals the, to creation that which was in her thought, hidden within godliness. So the Rebbe says speech, has two characteristics of a human. One, it reveals what's, what I have in mind. And second, it leaves me and is separated from me. Says the Rebbe, by God, speech is only the first part, the positive part, which is revealing what God wanted. The Alter Rebbe's words. God's speech is called speech only in order to illustrate that quality of revelation which it possesses for just as man's speech reveals to his audience what was hidden and concealed in his thought, so too the emergence of the light and life force of the ain't so from concealment before creation into revelation through the act of creation for the purpose of creating and animating the world is called speech. Therefore, God used the word speech because he had created the universe. In this case, the audience is the created beings, which, from its own perspective at least, is separated from God. And this is, it is there, these revelations of divine light and light force that comprise, comprise the ten divine utterances recorded in the Torah, namely, and God says, let there be light, 
let the earth sprout forth, and so on, by which the world was created. Likewise, all the other words of the Torah, the prophets, and the holy writings are also called speech, even though they were not revealed for the purpose of creation, since they too represent the divine revelation which the prophets perceived in the prophetic vision. So that's the idea of speech by God. Speech is revealing that which was internalized. Hence, when we refer to God's revelation as his speech, the analogy extends only to speech as revelation of the commu and communication, but not to speech as something separated from separate from the speaker, an idea which is not applicable to godliness. Thus, God's speech and thought are united with them in absolute union, just like the speech and thought of men before he actually expresses them as speech and thought rather as they are while still in his faculty of wisdom and intellect. Just like when I'm thinking with words in my brains, it's still in me, didn't leave me and nobody knows. God's speech when he leaves him and creates something communicating to others is still connected with God and part of God. Or as they exist in a desire or craving that are still in the heart before they rise from the heart to the brain. There to, there to be meditated upon with the letters of thought. At that point in the desire, before one speaks or thinks, the letters of his speech and thought, which evolves from the aforementioned longing and desire, were still in a potential state in the art, where they were absolutely unified with the source, namely the wisdom and intellect of the in the brain and the longing and desire of the heart. In the case of mortal, his thought and speech are completely unified with them before he speaks. At that point, the letters which constitute his thought and speech are still telescoped within their source. In the case of the creator, however, however his thought and speech remain unified with him even after he thinks and speaks. They are always within its the source, the omnipresent, the omnipresent God, as the Alter Rebbe now concludes. And precisely so, by way of analogy, are God's speech and thought absolutely united with his essence and being even after his speech has already become materialized in the creation of the worlds just as it was united with them before the world were created. I hope everybody can follow and understand. I gave you the introduction so you can continue re reading. Any questions? No questions. Thus, for God, nothing whatsoever was changed by the revelation of his creative power in creation. The change wrought by creation exists only with regards to the created beings who receive their life's force from God's word when it proceeds from concealment to actualization with the creation of the world. The rabbi is going to talk about the following. Because there are four universes, there are four worlds. In general, there are four worlds. You probably skip the first four or five chapters of Tanya, we study about four worlds. The rabbi is going to talk about an idea that to me is obvious and I don't think we need to elaborate. Imagine you're a teacher at uh, first grade, or I'm sorry, you're earlier, four years old, and you need to teach them one plus one is two. So you take two, two candies, two lollipops, and you say, here is a lollipop. And here is a lollipop. How many lollipops I have in my hand? The children will answer what? Two, right? Do they understand the math of one plus one is two? Yeah. Bob, is that correct that they don't understand? Why don't they understand? They weren't, they weren't taught the idea of one plus one is two. They just thought that there's two lollipops. Very good. So when I explain a difficult stu uh, student, with a parable or a story and they get the parable does it mean that they understand the point I shared with them not necessarily 
when I share with you a point and I say to you, I share that with you completely, and I ask you, did you understand? And you answer yes. Is it possible that my understanding is far deeper than you understand when you learn it for the first time? Yeah. It's possible. <laughs> I'm more than sure right there. Yeah. So the idea, <laughs> the idea is one. It's the same idea. The child knows that there are two candies because the teacher took out from the drawer one lollipop and then another lollipop. So now he has two. I, the teacher, know that one plus one is math. It's a simple math, makes it two. We both know that there are two candies here. My understanding of the two candies is different than the child. When I give you a parable to explain a point, I am sharing your understanding of the point might be totally, even though you understand fully the parable and you understand what the point I'm trying, but that point is totally different for the teacher because the teacher has discovered much deeper aspects of that idea. Is that clear? So here is an example. When I, in Hebrew, nobody speaks uh, fluent Hebrew here. If I say en koach, anybody knows what en koach is? In Yiddish, we say chob nishken koyach. <laughs> what does it mean? Huh? Really? That's something new. Chob nishken koyach means I have no energy. But it's a metaphor. And I'm going to ask you, how many interpretation can you find to someone answering you, I have no energy? So let's start. I ask my child, can you go home and pick up my keys? Or can I ask you a favor? And he says, I have no energy. What does it mean to say? I don't want to do it. When I ask you, would you like to study? And you say, I have no energy. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh -huh. Not interested, right? Generally, it's not interested. In relationship, I have no energy. It's totally different. I have a headache. Huh? I have a headache. I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. I say I have no energy. If someone says to me, let's go and visit mom, and I say I have no energy, no. what does that mean? No. Huh? It doesn't mean that I'm tired. It doesn't have no energy. It means oh, I'm not I'm not interested. But they are not in, they are, I am not interested is totally different from one scenario to another between parents and children, between spouses, between teacher and so if so, if I ask someone, did you understand what I just said? And he says, I have no energy. <laughs> what, <laughs> what does that, that mean? Sense. Huh? That doesn't make sense. And I'm gonna show with you something that mostly I use when you really want to for lack of better words, get rid of somebody. You say, I have no koyach. You know, I have no energy. I'm I'm drained. I'm drained. Meaning, can you live, can you give me some space, right? Can you give me, does it happen to anyone here? Or I'm the only one saying that? Ah, mm -hmm. huh? sometimes you you say that. Some of to, actually have no huh? Some of actually have no energy. Really? <laughs> So when someone says I have no energy, do they really have no energy? Sometimes, yeah. Most of the time, no, yeah. right? So when I say I have no energy to my child or to a friend or to a congregant or to an employee, or, or to a, what if you get a, sell, a call, a, somebody is trying to sell you a copy machine? <laughs> And I say I have no energy. <laughs> well, then, that's a perfect sale point. You need coffee. Copy <laughs> machine, not coffee. Copy air. <laughs> For coffee, God forbid, you should say I have no energy. <laughs> the idea is that what I'm saying is 
I want to disengage. That's that's what it is. But the way you hear it, it depends on the situation. And you will hear it, in, it means totally different things based on the situation. In Yiddish, we say, we, I, you never heard that, Harry? Huh? Okay, so when I asked, you didn't. In Hebrew, my mother, all the time, she would say, and likoach, and likoach. She wouldn't even, uh, you know, whatever. Now we know when you say it, we should just go. <laughs> right. But it's a nicer way to say I'm not interested. Say nice. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> right. You would say I'm not What happens if your child says to you, why does the boss uh, paint it in yellow? I'm sorry. Why do they paint old school bosses yellow? They have more energy. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Green, red, they have blue. They yellow. <laughs> I used to ask my mother a lot of questions. I'll never forget all of my life. She says, she would say, when, when I dated my wife, the I did it very few times. The first, aside from education, that was very important. I told my wife that I want to make sure that when my children ask me questions, no matter how tired I am, I will not say I have no koyach, I have no energy. Right. Am I guilty of that sin? No, perhaps, <laughs> but I definitely always, if I want to, if it's on my tongue, it reminds me how I felt. So I would say to them, Can you ask me later? or I'm not sure, or this is, it takes much longer to answer. You know, why the boss is the paint yellow? I don't, I don't, I really don't know. I have to check, I can Google it, <laughs> but I wouldn't have an answer, but I wouldn't say I have no koyach, even though I truly have no koyach, I have no energy. But I'm not such a righteous man, by the way. I'm not the best daddy, but uh, I'm just sharing to you. Yes. <laughs> Go ask your father. She would say to me, I don't know. And I would say, what do you mean you don't know? You're, you're my mother. She would say, I have no koyach. I live through it. So anyway, back to our discussion. I can tell you what I did. Today they don't even need to ask the, the parents. Yeah. They can they can go directly. So when you have when you have a oh the same the same thing if someone tells you it's a long story. <laughs> but I, I meant it. I really meant it. She has to qualify. I meant it because if not, you would think that they push you off, right? They're not interested in engaging. It's a long story. Hi, how you been? It's a long story. <laughs> Where were you last night? It's a long story. <laughs> Why are you late? It's a long story. Yeah, the, the, each answer is different from the one who says it to the one who hears it. Do we all agree? When I tell you it's a long story or I have no energy, you might interpret it one way the way I wanted you to interpret it, but I interpret it totally different way. In other words, when you speak, there's another negative part, which is I can try to express myself well, not necessarily it's going to work out. It's not necessarily going to work out. I was asked to give a class to a, uh, a large group of elderly people and I was asked to repeat the same class twice. I will never forget. And the topic was a very challenging topic. It was mikveh and purity. There used to be here Jewish hostel. The JCC, Dan Bernstein, would bring in elderly for, for about a week to study here. Do you, do you, you don't remember the hostel program? Okay. So they, he did it here because he was very happy about that. And he wanted me to teach Kabbalah and they wanted Kabbalah of purity, of, of the law of purity. So I prepared well for an hour and a half. I had a group of probably 200 people 
And I had to repeat the same. This, in other words, I offered because at the same time there was other classes. The first one went flawlessly. It was so good that a bunch of people said they wanted to hear it again. The second time around, it was such a shanda that they went to the organizers and say, this is, it's an embarrassment. It does not belong. It shouldn't be teaching. Were they right? Perhaps. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't tired. I didn't walk up. I, I, you never know. You know, you need some uh, muzzle. You need some good luck. I didn't walk up. And it happened to me um, a, a similar, similar scenarios a few times. It's not the speech, the, the power of it's very powerful. It connects people, it shows how you feel, but it's not necessarily going to walk out the way exactly the way you want. It's not, there is no uh, a guarantee to, and as I shared with you, things that you mean and you express because you mean it in a certain way will be perceived by the listener, by the recipients, and totally the opposite, that, that differently, and sometimes get offended, etc. How much more so when there is a barrier of different cultures? When you bring in Europe, Israel, or South America culture, there are words or phrases you say, and here they will be offensive, or over there they will be offensive. <laughs> Says the Rebbe that by God, when God uses speech, it comes only with the positive and no negativity. So A, it never leaves God. He has full control over it. Therefore, it can come out perfect. By me, once I spoke, it left. So you can interpret it differently. And therefore, you can get hurt. You can get upset. And all you may not be able to understand fully what I want to say. For God, it has to be perfect because he's in full control. Just like when I'm thinking, if I decide not to think about something, I stop thinking about it. I start thinking about something else. And therefore, and then my thought process goes in the right direction. <clears throat> Says the Rebbe, that that's the reason for us, the speech looks like God ex said the speech and he left the speech. But that's for me like a child who saw two candies and says the total of candies is two. But for God, he's the professor of math. For him, math, those two candies represent math of one plus one. And therefore, his understanding, the teacher versus the student are totally far removed from one another. So we see God's speech as an entity for itself on its own, just like we know speech, but from God's perspective, it's totally different. All the contractions, I'm on page three, uh, 293 on top. All the contractions constitute a veiling of the divine con con countenance. That is, they veil and conceal the face, that is, the essential speech aspects of the light and life force that are derived from God's word, so that it would not reveal itself with an intense radiance, which the lower worlds would be incapable of perceiving. Therefore, too, because it is thus obscured through tzimtzum contraction, the light and life force of God's word that is closed in them appears to them as if it is something separate from God himself and as though it only issues from him just as the speech of a human being issues from him but then becomes separated from him. This false perception of the godly life force as something separate from God is possible only because the life force is hidden from the creation by means of Tzim Tzumim, which we'll discuss in later chapters. Yet in regards to God, no concealment or veil hides or obscures anything from him. To him, darkness, concealment, and light, revelation are alike. As it is written, even the darkness does not obscure anything from you. So for me, there is something called darkness and something called light. Darkness you cannot see, light you can see. For God, darkness and light are the same. So when he revealed or he conceals, there's nothing to do with God. When he spoke, the words are still with God and he has full control, just like my thinking process. This may also be interpreted. Even the darkness does not obscure because it derives from you. That is, the veil of tzimtzum, of contraction, is itself of divine origin, 
and therefore it cannot obscure godliness. For as the Alter Rebbe goes on to say, only a foreign body can constitute an obstruction. One cannot hide from his own self. Do you know that when we say a prayer, we need to cover our head? Anybody is aware? For men, not women. Men need to cover their head when they say a prayer. Anybody is familiar with that? Huh? So if I have no yarmulka and I need to say a prayer, let's say I want to eat an apple and I'll say blessing, I need to put something over my head. So I would use a tissue, a napkin, something. Can I put my hand and cover my head? No. 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 Why not? Very good. You're right on target. The purpose of the covering is to conceal part of me and remind me that above me is God. If I put my hand, my arm, and I cover my head, my head like that, there is no concealment. It's part of me. I cannot conceal myself. You can conceal me. The table, the room, a foreign object can conceal me. I cannot conceal myself. That's why in Jewish law, I cannot conceal myself. I cannot put, yes. Yes, of course. And that's what happens. Many times I'm at the beach or in a pool and I want a drink and I need to make a blessing. And I'm too lazy to get out and take a cap or something. So I get my child or someone in the pool and I says, put your head on my, I can put my head on yours. We make the prayer, we make the blessing, not a problem. It's only my own body cannot cover myself. When you utter God's name, you have to cover your head. There has to be a concealment over your head. Not over your arm, not over your shoulders, over your head. The highest part of your body. And you're concealing from God? or, or you're, you I'm concealing? creating a separation. The concealment is to separate between me and God, and then I'm calling out to God. So if I do not have, as I said, that happens, I'm in a pool or in a beach, and I want to drink or eat something, I have to make a prayer. If I don't have a cap or I don't have a something, an object, plastic, it doesn't matter, a paper plate, I can cover with a paper plate. If I don't have anything, I cannot do it with my own arm. By the way, if, my, if I have this, a shirt, I can do like that. Many times you've seen restaurants, Hasidim try to have double covers. Anybody knows about double covers? Yeah. How do you know? Yeah. When I pray, I use double cover. When people pray, they put the talis over their head. It's a double cover. Hasidic yamulkas would have a liner. Why do we have a liner? Double cover. That's why keep a suga, the weaved yamulka like Bob has. And like uh, Harry is for someone who follow Hasidic teaching, follow Hasidic method is unacceptable. Why? Huh? <laughs> it's single. Why? Because there's no double layers. Exactly. So, when so you... just a minute. So for example, my mm -hmm. father will not say God's name unless he has two covers, two covering. So whenever he goes to do grace after meal, he would put on a hat. The hat is too. Now I'm sitting at a, at a restaurant many times. He, he always would take his hat, but let's say at the beach, when I was a child, you take us to the beach, sit down, he would sit with a yamuka because he wasn't going to the water. And then we had a watermelon, we had something, but my father wants to make a blessing. He would take the sleeve and put over his yamuka. Now he has two covers and that's, that's enough. So. With this, this is a good cover. This alone is not a cover. Why? I'm going back to our discussion because I want to finish the chapter. Because you cannot conceal yourself. By the way, it applies to many other aspects in Jewish law. This is the yamukah is a very common, many people are aware of. There are many aspects in Jewish law where concealment will not apply if the person is concealing himself. Uh, there is another example, I, I, and I'm not going to address it with questions. Huh? Huh? 
Tachnun, no, you do that and it's okay. Ah, uh, you need what? No, you need to lower your hand. That's not about concealment. I don't think so, because sometimes you do. Actually, that's why they put the tefillin strap. You know that? You know that? Okay. I wanted to talk about another example. When a person enters a mikveh, for whatever purpose, conversion, immersion after a menstrual period, or before Shabbat, before Yom Kippur, the entire body has to be covered completely at the same time. You cannot dip yourself half and half. It has to be complete. So if I have a uh, stain or I have something that that's, that is on my skin and I go to the mikveh, it's not kosher because not my entire body didn't. That's why the mikveh lady checks the, the women before they immerse to the mikveh to make sure. Now, the rule is that the body, the water have to come to, have to enter every part of the body, including my mouth. How is it possible? So uh, how do you, what do we do? We shut our lips when we go to the mikveh. And the answer is because it's my own lips, they, they are not concealing the rest of my body. The same is people with ear infection. Some people, for some people, that's a problem. If they immerse themselves in the water and their ear has no plugs, water will come into their ears and it's not good. So if you go to the mikveh and you put air plugs, it's, it, you are blocking the water from entering your body. What do they do? They put the fingers. If you put your fingers, your finger is not concealed, never serves concealment, and that serves it. So the fact that the water didn't enter deep into the ear tunnel is a technical reason, but there was no uh, ab obstruction or concealment to the body. I said I don't want to address questions to that to this topic. This may also, uh, I'm sorry, um, thus it is written, God, he is the Lord, as is explained elsewhere. This is a whole different, let's see in the commentary what he explains very briefly. In Hebrew, the divine name of Vaya, yud ki vav he is Elohim. The four-letter name of God denotes divine revelation and transcendence. While the name Elohim refers to God's power of self-concealment by which he vests himself in creation, the quotation points out that they are one, Elohim, and does not act as a veil obscuring God by the other name. Thus, Elohim does not act as a veil obscuring God since it is essentially one with Yud Kevav K, the power of revelation. There are two of God's names. Six. There are six known names to God. Two of them we use all the time. Elohim, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the word Elohim. And the word Avaya, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu, Avaya Elokeinu. Avaya is Yud K, Vav K, four letters, at numerical value of 26. Elohim, with a He, not Kuf, is the numerical value of 86. Nature, Hateva, the word nature in Hebrew is also 86. So Elohim is responsible for the system of the universe. Abaye is responsible for miracles. Anytime you, we talk about miracles, we speak to the higher level of godliness, the second name. They are Elohim conceals Avaya and that creates the universe. That's when the universe can be created. It's like a veil that stops the light from shining so brightly that nobody can benefit from it. And therefore they are one, says the, the Torah tells us, Avaya and Elohim is one. In other words, concealment, self-concealment is no such thing. And therefore Elohim is part of Avaya and Avaya is part of Elohim. Therefore, in his presence, all else is of absolute no account since God is not affected by the tzimtzumim, by the contraction, which make it possible for a created being to feel separate from him. He perceives all the creations brought into being by his word as being still within the source himself. There they are in a state of absolute nullification. From his perspective, they are still non-entities. 
And the fact that their of their creation in no way abstract detracts from his absolute unity. He is one alone after creation, just as he was before creation. So now we can address the question we asked two chapters ago. How can you say God is the same before the world was created and after? The answer is just like one thought in, of my mind, one word in my thinking process. Does it does it change my existence? Does it change my entity? The answer is no. When God spoke the 127 words, the 10 utterances to create the universe, the words of God are in full, is in full control. He controlled them even after they left him. Just like thinking process. So for me, like the little child who sees candies, I know it's two, one plus two, but I don't understand the math. For God, so I see it as speech, revelation, creation, something that didn't exist before. But for God, from his perspective, nothing has changed before, after the universe was created. God is in full control of the universe there, and, and still it has no effect, no impact whatsoever on him. Next lesson, not next week, but in three weeks' time, we will go into the understanding of what happens when men sin. Why can we offend God if all is in God's speech? God still controls everything with his speech. He continuously speaking. If he took word, if he took back some of the words, there will be nothing of existence. And we that would be the topic of our discussion. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.